Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and a welcome to the Strategic in Forum on Nuclear Innovation, uh, Thinking Outside of the Dome. I am incredibly excited uh, to, to be with all of you today uh, to explore a topic that is very, very near and dear to, to my heart. So I think that all of you know that there has been a wave of innovation that has been sweeping the global nuclear sector. Of course, everybody is quite excited about advanced reactors, small modular reactors, micro reactor desi designs that are going to be demonstrated in the next few years and that, that could really mark the beginning of a profound change in the nuclear technology landscape. But of course, this is not really new. The sector has continuously implemented improvements in plan operations, in project management, and in the overall uh, fuel cycle. So, so in some sense, innovation is not really new to nuclear, but, but really what we want to do today is maybe enhance this and, and embrace this spirit of nuclear innovation going beyond this uh, outside of the reactor dome. So for that, uh, what we are going to do today is uh, move beyond sole consideration of just reactor technology and nuclear technology. And we are going to try to draw some of the lessons learned from other industries uh, that have had transformative changes in, in recent times. And maybe we are going to try to adapt these lessons learned and these ideas into, into the nuclear sector. Um, and, you know, we really want to broaden the, the traditional dialogue on nuclear innovation. And for that, we really want to go beyond technology and perhaps uh, explore interactions and other aspects that make an innovation successful and, and commercially deployable, such as interaction with policies, decision makers, regulation, investment. And, and see also how maybe the, the culture of innovation that, create, that appears within a given sector is going to really translate in a very successful and, and positive can-do attitude that is going to help the sector to innovate and to grow incredibly fast. So, so today uh, we have a panel of quite interesting and diverse speakers and experts that are going to help us explore all these questions and hopefully they are going to give us some suggestions, some, some actionable ideas uh, in order to perhaps bring suggestions and, and lessons learned from other uh, industries, other sectors into the nuclear industry. So let me start by ask all my panelists to, to briefly turn on their cameras while I introduce them. Uh, so today I am going to be joined by a steam panel of experts, and I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly. So first, um, Dr. Rita Baramwal, who is the president and nuclear, uh, of nuclear and chief nuclear officer at Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, uh, in the US. Uh, Rita has uh, overall management and technical responsibility for the research and development activities conducted by EPRI, uh, with its global membership related to nuclear generation. Before joining EPRI, uh, Rita served as Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy in the US Department of Energy. Um, prior to that, she was the Director of the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear, GAIN, at the Idaho National Laboratory. So welcome, welcome, Rita. Also joining us, we have Dr. Bin Chen, who is the deputy director of the research and development de department at, at Synergy Company, a subsidiary of China National Nuclear Corporation, dedicated to the development of high temperature gas cool reactors. He has been working as a senior management for global marketing and international projects, as well as a senior engineer for thermal hydraulics and safety analysis in the design of generation three nuclear power plants and advanced nuclear reactors. He is also an invited professor of nuclear academy at Three Gorges University, and he also serves as co-chair uh, in several international uh, conferences such as ICON, and PNECEN. So he is an alumni of the World Nuclear Association Summer Institute in 2016. So that is that is makes us very proud that, that our alumni 
are going moving forward to be enormously successful, such as yourself, Dr. Chen. So let me continue introducing Professor James Henderson Naismith, who is a professor of structural bio biology at the University of Oxford and the director of the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Uh, the objective of the Institute is to develop disruptive new technologies designed to tackle major challenges in health and life sciences, accelerate the discovery of new treatment for chronic diseases affecting millions of people around the world, such as dementia. Uh, Jim is also a former director of the research complex at Harwell and also previously served as, as Bishop Wardlow Professor of Chemical Biology at the University of St. Andrews. He has devoted his scientific career to the development of new therapeutic compounds and the identification of novel targets specific to microbial, microbial, oh, sorry, microbial pathogens. Welcome, Jim. It is a pleasure to, to have you with us today. Uh, next, I go to Dr. Nina Skorupska, who is the Chief Executive of the UK Renewable Energy Association. And prior to joining REA in 2013, Nina worked for 20 years for the RWE Group uh, and the, the, the UK predecessor, the National Power, Empower, etc. And she worked across fuel engineering and research and development, power station operations, and trading, where she was Empower's first female power station manager. Great for you, Nina. Um, uh, her last RWE role was CTO Essent, uh, which is one of the Dutch businesses. So as a board member of Transport for London and Real, which is a REA subsidiary, she also advises Carbon Trust, National Grid, ESO, and Energy Research Accelerator and others. So she received her CVE in 2016 for her services to renewables and promoting diversity in the energy industry. Now coming from, from Finland, we have Dr. Bile Tulki, who currently works at BTT Technical Research Center in Finland as a re leader in reactor analysis team. Uh, Tulki is the coordinator of the Euratom funded project Elsmore, which works towards European licensing of small modular reactors. He's currently managing BTT's work on conceptual designs for a district heating reactor suitable for European networks. Tulki is also responsible leader for ECO SMR's project, which aims to create business opportunities related to small modular reactors for Finnish companies. And then let me go to our last speaker, last but not least, Mr. Mikhail Turundaev, who is the CEO of Rusatom Additive Technologies, which is engaged in the production and popularization of domestic 3D printing technologies. Mikhail coordinates the activities of all the divisions, oversees the business strategy, and carries out effective interaction with enterprises of the nuclear industry that are part of the Rosatom management loop and have the potential to introduce additive technologies into production. Mikhail has extensive experience with many European companies such as Schneider Electric, Alstom Power, BR, BNR Industrial Automation, and Siemens. So once again, thank you all of you for, for joining us today. I really am very much looking forward to a quite uh, diverse uh, point of view, a good bunch of point of views regarding uh, innovation and, and bringing new ideas into market fruition. So, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you, Jim, because obviously I think that we all are quite aware of where we are in the middle of, of our COVID, our COVID uh, uh, pandemic. You know, 18 months ago at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, experts anticipated that the development of a COVID vaccine would take several years to develop. Yet less than a year later, here we are, and we have not one, but several successful vaccines that had been effectively deployed at large scale in many countries in the world. So, so what happened? 
what kind of innovation or combination of innovative approaches do you think that facilitated the acceleration of the vaccine development of obviously the streamlining of the regulatory approval process and finally the, the fast tracking of the mass production yeah that's a good question i think there are some important lessons we can learn which is that government across the world have been funding so-called blue skies research for a long time and some of these technologies were already you know had come out from academic labs that were funded on the basis of doing interesting things and one of the things that we struggle with is all the snow when something will become interesting it's quite hard to pick in advance although it's usually good to look in important areas such as respiratory disease for example so uh, you know, and I want to emphasize I've had no direct role in any of this. But in the Oxford case, these people had been working uh, based on the SARS-CoV pandemic against vaccines against coronaviruses. So they had taken the technology quite a long way down the road, but there was never a case where there was funding to make that big leap into translation. In uh, Moderna, uh, BioNTech and uh, their, their uh, RNA technology, again, People had, that had come out from laboratory work and there had been some hope that it could be used as a vaccine, but people were unsure whether it would work. And what really shifted all of this was the economic calculus. So, you know, once we began to see mass lockdowns, very high numbers of deaths in the West, the cost of uh, dealing with the pandemic, suddenly the cost of accelerating clinical trials was mar was minuscule in comparison. And so what we saw was just a, a sudden rush from the science community to be of service, uh, built on that kind of long-term uh, funding of basic science. And in the UK, at least, the involvement of AstraZeneca with the Oxford vaccine was critical in sort of delivering a product that could be actually stuck into arms. And the same is true for Pfizer's partnership with BioNTech that large companies have that depth of expertise necessary to take uh, fledgling technologies and turn them into real products. And of course, I'm sure uh, Dr. Chen will, Dr. Chen will tell us that in China, th there'd been a lot of investment in vaccine programs there, and China also drove forward its vaccination program. So I would say the things, if I summarize then, there had been technology in the, being developed. It had never been tested in anger because there was never the funding or the identified need. Suddenly that need and the funding came along and you had a science community desperate to show the value of years of investment. And, and that's what drove this. And of course, it was easy to do clinical trials because we had vast numbers of patients. And, and that's an important consideration that it will be very hard to replicate some of this. And my concern will be that there's a lot of promising science directed against treatments of the disease rather than vaccine that may struggle to be funded or they may struggle to be tested and that means that we might not get all the gains we would like from this pandemic scientifically mm -hmm. those gains would prepare us against a future pandemic i should say not scientific gains right right so that's that's quite quite interesting so so essentially what we faced with the pandemic was a perfect storm if you wish of a lot of underlying technology that was looking for an outlet and of course a dire need to, to actually use it. So, so that's that's quite interesting. So let me let me turn to you, Rita, um, and maybe move now a little bit into, into the power industry. Obviously, um, EPRI works with the power industry as a whole, not just the nuclear industry. So do, do you guys see opportunities to, to cross-pollinate within the power sector? And, and are these opportunities that you see are, if you see some of these opportunities, are they mostly focused on, on the technology or do you see uh, quite different uh, types of, of uh, in the way that the innovation culture develops in the various subsectors sub of the power industry? So uh, thanks, thank you very much, Sama, for having me. Thank you to David for um, coordinating us to be here together today. And um, EPRI uh, definitely looks to coordinating with other uh, electricity and, and heat sources 
um, to meet clean, clean energy goals around the world. And we actually have recently launched a low carbon resources initiative that's really focused on a research and development commitment to develop pathways to advance low carbon technologies for large scale deployment through 2030 and beyond. And this initiative is led jointly by EPRI and GTI. The goal is to enable a risk informed understanding of options and technologies that enable significant economy-wide decarbonization through partnerships globally, as well as demonstrations. That's the really key part, right? We can talk about it and we can design it all we want, but if we do not demonstrate it, it's all for naught. So demonstration is really important. Applied engineering developments and technology acceleration are some of the most promising options. And the, this LCRI, um, the, the initiative works in concert with the other programs that we have across EPRI including many that are based in our nuclear sector. And we coordinate with EPRI's research and development priorities to help accelerate carbon reduction across the entire economy. Um, the second part of your question, Salma, I believe is really around um, the how and how do, we, how do we go about doing it? And we've already touched on it a little bit in the few minutes we've been together. And that culture of innovation is something that I think is almost dissonant with the traditional nuclear energy culture. We are a very conservative uh, organ, you know, ent entity, a conservative sector, um, rightly so in some cases. Uh, perfection is the expectation in almost everything that we do. But I think when it comes to innovation, we need to take a step back, step outside of the dome, the, the topic of this panel, um, and, and really think differently. And allow, allow uh, innovators, allow researchers to move quickly, to make mistakes, to fail, to pivot, and to move on to the next iteration of the experiment or, or trial of the, of the technology. And, and so that culture is really, really important, um, but it is, uh, we, we must recognize that it's not um, going to be welcomed with open arms in our nuclear industry because it's just not the nature of, of the industry. So to allow for the, that culture to thrive will require a lot of leadership. Um, it will require a lot of incentives. In, and I don't mean financial incentives. I just mean the acknowledgement even. Um, you know, for example, Sama, you did a good job, you know, good, good try on, on that experiment. It didn't work out. That's okay. Let's move on to the next idea or the next uh, trial. Uh, and then also, um, I, I want to touch on, on some of uh, what I have seen from, from David Hess is the, the connection with what we do and the communication of it through social media. Um, it, it's really important to not only be innovating, but to be sharing what we're doing, and then also taking feedback in, uh, constructive feedback, and iterating on, on that technology and on that innovation as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ritano. Those are incredibly important points. I, I agree that, uh, and, and this is something that I definitely would like to explore us together a little bit more because the technology is clearly very important, but the entire ecosystem, the entire culture of innovation and how do we present this to ourselves and to, to the world is, is quite important. So let me turn now to, to Nina, uh, because uh, clearly uh, I, I really am very, very interested in, in hearing the point of view from the, from the renewable industry in general, and perhaps in particular from, from wind and solar photovoltaic. Clearly, uh, renewables have seen incredible development and incredible advances in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And, and obviously, uh, I think, according to, to some, this has been the result of perhaps a concerted effort between the government, the industry, and, and society as a whole, really. The, 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 the importance that we have put into, into moving towards sustainable energy technologies. So how do you see this from your side? What, what is your, I mean, obviously you see it from the inside, right? So maybe <laughs> you can give us a much more detailed point of view. Well, uh, thanks for that question. Um, a remarkable journey and nothing drives innovation than having an imperative goal that you have to meet. 
And if you, and you say, look, look back 10, 15 years, that's when all governments came together and recognized the importance of climate change. And, but everybody took different paths of what they thought that meant for their businesses. So for the incumbent energy providers, let's talk about power in particular. I would say even my old company, RWE, who relied on uh, lignite fired power plants, nuclear, gas, um, you know, was denying that maybe solar would be viable in northern parts of Europe and in the UK, of course, it's always raining. So solar would never work in the UK. Those were the views and it needed government legislation and some market instruments, which would then suddenly create the pull for that change to happen. So look, what's happened in the last 10 years? Uh, I'm, I'm quoting IRENA, the International Renewable Energy um, Association, in terms of what they've been progressing. We've seen in the last 10 years, solar to drop in prices by close to 80%, 80% from back just 10 years, and wind, onshore wind by 40%, and offshore wind down by as well a further 30%. And those... All, of, all that race to what we now call race to net zero, which is what the COP26 and the UNFCCC are really promoting and the ICC as well, um, it's driven that agenda. So innovation and funds from government appeared, but they had to create that market. But then the other aspect that had to happen, which is happening more rigorously now that we're in 2021, is regulation. And saying that doing the same of what you've always done cannot be accepted. So you see the pressures brought to bear by society on the larger oil and gas companies, you know, landmark decisions for Exxon and the massive decision for Shell and the Amsterdam by saying, look, your ambition to change and to wean us off fossil fuels, you know, is just not acceptable. So there are the three prongs in it. Is the technology and the innovation there, which is driven by R&D and bringing those great minds together, the social and economic will, and then creating now the markets. So there's a, for power though, we know that the future is going to be more electrified because all the different forms of energy are now all much more closely coupled how we elect, use our electricity, electrification of heat in some cases, and also electrification of transport. So the demand for net zero derived power is going to be escalating. It will be doubling. On the same side as the thing that we now need to engage, but maybe we'll talk about this later, is the power of the people and the different communities and the regions of how they engage is what's the right solution for the different countries and nations around the world. Because there's one thing about renewable energy that's very different than our traditional sources. It's more decentralized, it's democratized. The advent of digitization allows us to accelerate decarbonization. How's that for an alliteration, Summer? That sounds perfect. No, I, I, you know, I think that you, you brought a point that I think is very important, which uh, is the importance of uh, government asserting itself and, and, and putting a vision forward that gives confidence to markets, that brings forward policies that are supporting of that vision. So I think that that is, I mean, of course, and we have to bring the people, the technology, everything else together. But I think the will and the and the the, the seriousness of the of the government is, is quite important. So that's a very important point. Let me turn to Bill to Bill and now. And you know, we just talk a little bit about about the importance of electrifying everything. But but I think that you are maybe going to tell us a little bit about other aspects. So let's move towards uh, the technology aspects in nuclear innovation. And in particular, I really am quite keen to learn about the work that you are doing um, in the Finnish research program, investigating the use of small modular reactors for district heating. 
So how does this come about? And, and of course, district heating is not new. I mean, we've used nuclear for district heating before, but so, so what is this different and, 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 and new and exciting? Yeah, thank you for this question. So of course, uh, using uh, district heating for, uh, or nuclear energy for district heating is not a new thing. We have uh, tens of uh, nuclear power plants uh, supplying some district heating to their local communities. And even like using a smaller local community reactor uh, for providing just DC heat is something that was uh, investigated in Finland, for instance, first time in 70s and with collaboration with Swedes, with ASEA Atom, we uh, did a secure reactor design. But at that point, uh, basically coal and uh, gas were uh, coming back and in the 80s, it was realized that the coal and gas were not running out. And what's the difference between that time and this time uh, is that, uh, well, climate change. We need to actually push coal and gas out of the energy system totally. So in Finland, we have actually electricity system that's very clean, but uh, our heating, which is most based on DC heating, still relies on burning. And Several years ago, actually, it was a call from uh, people, from uh, new uh, local politicians asking for a nuclear energy solution for their disk heating, uh, for cleaning the disk heat. So we actually were uh, finding out that people wanted to have like uh, solutions to provide district heating during the dark, long, cold winter. And they were seeing nuclear energy as one of them. And the thing is that at that point, there were no offering on the market. So we as a, like industry, you could say that we were like uh, caught pants down in the sense that uh, now people want nuclear energy, but there was no product. Of course, in, now in China, we see, and we were over here about uh, the heating project, but they are still for a very large cities for people of millions. So what we are now at TTT trying to look into would be a suitable, uh, nu what, what it would lo look like to have a suitable nuclear reactor producing uh, DC heating for a city of like 50,000 people. And when we are looking past Finland in European networks in uh, Eastern Central Europe, Poland, Czechia, these kind of places, they have DC heating networks uh, that are fueled with coal and gas, and they also need this kind of like solution. So we are <laughs> basically, it was so that we heard about the democratization of the energy. And I think that basically this first push actually came from the people to please give us a solution for the climate change. That is very exciting. No, that's, that's great. Thank you, Ville. So, you know, let's to turn to, to Dr. Chen, uh, because obviously, as, as, as Ville just mentioned, you are also doing quite a lot of work uh, in, in, in looking into, into applications of nuclear, perhaps beyond the traditional electricity production. So could you give us some, some highlights of some of the things that you guys are working on? For sure, for sure, thank you so much. And uh, can we uh, show the slides now or uh, later? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there they are. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, um, thank you all. Um, for, it's my uh, honor to be here today to show you some of the uh, demo station projects for the innovative and comprehensive application of nuclear power in China. And if I may summarize of my slides for two words and also quote from Rita and Lila, one thing is demonstration. The other thing is connection. Demonstration is so important because it turns the design into real things. And it shows you in reality that how a project could be run commercially and feasibly. And here I'm, I'm showing you that this high young nuclear power plant started operation since two years ago and commercially hitting through co-generation for the first time and hitting for 700,000 square meters. So it's really feasible. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Another project now under construction, also in Shandong, is what we call a comprehensive power center. It's a combination of nuclear, wind, and solar, as well as a supplementary hydrogen production, also for power storage. And we would say that this comprehensive power center would be a perfect demonstration of how all different energy sources could be, could be put together and also not only economically feasible, but also technologically. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. And the driven force, why we are trying to have this demonstration project because our government have the commitment for the carbon oxide neutrality. And also we have a promise to the world for environmental protection, as well as the energy conservation. Next slide, please. And this is done by the consortium between the designers who comes with the innovative ideas, which are not repeating what we have done as yesterday. And, and also along together with the vendors and with the utilities and supported by the government. Next slide, please. And these two new demonstration projects for the small modular reactor. One is PWR, another one is high temperature gas cool reactor is the key to resolve all the questions. The first one now has already started its construction and the HTR, we are quite positive to see its commercial operation. We, we hope it will happen this year or maybe quite early next year. Next slide, please. And the connection, why connection is so important because all these are supported, not only promoted by the designer or just by the government, but as a collaboration from all the parts. And also the administration, the regulators are so important. For example, this guidance on emergency preparation of advanced SMRs are the key for the innovative technology to be loosened from the burden of the old designs and to have the potential for massive deployment in the future. Because nuclear power is a um, replaceable energy source for all of us. Next slide, please. And another example here I would like to emphasize is innovative and comprehensive utilization of high temperature reactor. Because the temperature it could provide is so high, it has much vast potentials for not only power generation, but also to replace the retiring fossil plants, to have the massive hydrogen production for a quite cheap, quite no cost, as well as supplying the steam for process heating or water desolation and all the other applications that you can imagine for without the emission of carbon oxide. Next slide, please. Uh, the one more thing I might share with you later. And thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chen. Quite exciting. A lot of very, very interesting uh, things that are taking place right now in, in, in China. So let me go to, to Mikhail, uh, because I really like to explore with you um, uh, additive and advanced manufacturing. Clearly, uh, there's been a, a transformative uh, advance in these technologies that have helped a lot in many industries. 
So perhaps do you could you give us some examples on how we can use advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing uh, into the nuclear sector? Thank you a lot for this uh, great opportunity to tell you about innovative technology which we are uh, implementing in nuclear in Rosatom and not only. Um, along with the development of uh, the traditional nuclear business, Rosatom actively develops new business areas, including but not limited to wind power, composite materials, nuclear medicine, waste management, oil and gas services, digital transformation, international logistics, and additive technologies. In the year of uh, in the year 2020, the value of global additive manufacturing market was about 12 billion US dollars and is expected to reach about uh, 50 billion uh, dollars by 2030. In order to combine all the competences of Rosatom in additive manufacturing, Rosatom created a subsidiary, Rosatom Additive Technologies, or uh, RUSAT for short, which uh, coordinates the activities of all companies of Rosatom involved in this business. RUSAT is focused on four key areas, manufacturing of 3D printers and their components, uh, production of materials and metal pudder for additive manufacturing, software development for additive systems and services, and additive manufacturing uh, printing services themselves. In uh, the end of 2020, we uh, launched Rosatom's first additive manufacturing technology center in Moscow, equipped with our own 3D printer, uh, 3D printing machines. Our development strategy includes the launch of global network of additive manufacturing centers, uh, both in Russia and abroad. Being part of Rosatom, we in RUSAT pay great attention to the development of additive manufacturing applications in the nuclear energy sector. We strongly believe that additive manufacturing is bringing new opportunities for nuclear industry, allowing to print replacement parts for NPP on demand and uh, manufacture complex geometries in one piece. Uh, one of the promising end use applications of additive manufacturing for the nuclear is on demand manufacturing of spare parts for NPPs uh, for shorter lead time and manufacturing of out of production parts to increase NPP life extension, for example. Uh, currently, we are working on four additive manufacturing technologies for nuclear applications. These technologies are uh, puder bed fusion, direct metal deposition, or DMD. Uh, plasma and arc wire additive manufacturing for printing with metal wire and uh, electron beam additive manufacturing. Uh, these technologies are used for manufacturing of parts with the complex geometries such as equipment components, nuclear power plants, spare parts, fuel assembly components, etc. Innovative materials allow to produce parts uh, with better characteristics and lower weight. For example, additive manufacturing of uh, reactor vessel internals allows to increase the number of cooling channels, reduce heat, and uh, as a result, extend the life cycle uh, and increase the reliability of the component. We perform a set of operations, including development of numerous models of additive manufacturing with various materials, such as uh, titanium, stainless steel, uh, puder and wire materials, out of pile tests of check uh, specimen, test of ion acceleration tube, as well as a neutron irradiation testing in reactor to confirm characteristics and prototype, uh, properties of 3D printed components. Standardization for the nuclear energy, energy sector is uh, one of the challenges for additive manufacturing and uh, specific standards for additive manufacturing do not ex exist yet in the nuclear industry, uh, which slows down its adoption for the nuclear. Um, one of the key goals is to prove uh, to the regulatory institution that additive manufacturing is a feasible, sustainable and reliable manufacturing method that can be successfully implemented in nuclear projects. We use the um, comparison of performance of parts from additive manufacturing and uh, conventional manufacturing process as a benchmark. Currently, we are in a process of creation of a knowledge and uh, application cases base uh, through pilot projects. We are working on now to pursue regulatory approval for nuclear use of the additive manufacturing. Uh, I, will, uh, I would like to share several application examples for additive manufacturing for production or 
critical and non-critical components. We use uh, PBF technology to print components with a uh, rather complex geometry, such as uh, uh, guide cards, uh, dust filters, and anti-debris filters. The mechanical characteristics of parts printed by PBF equipment are comparable to the conventional casting method. PBF technology allows us to use uh, no tooling and reduce time for R&D and manufacturing, in addition to weight reduction due to complex profile structural elements and internal parts, as well as uh, high utilization of uh, powder material. The application case of uh, D&D technology is additive manufacturing of heavy shield with diameter up to two meters and one meter in height. Um, this technology is very useful for production of uh, large size products with complex geometry. Uh, DMD process allows uh, you to quickly change the composition of the uh, metal by injecting uh, different types of uh, metal powders. Uh, DMD technology is um, especially interesting for rapid repair or uh, of old or worn uh, components made of titanium, steel, aluminium, copper, etc. As I've already mentioned, it, uh, it's a very promising application for additive manufacturing for the nuclear. Uh, regardless of, uh, of the additive manufacturing technology, uh, quality control and qualification uh, procedure are essential and shall be addressed not only to components uh, produced with the use of additive manufacturing, but also to the uh, powder feedstock, uh, virus testing and process monitoring. Uh, these are the issue where uh, there, there are issues uh, we are working on at uh, the moment, including nuclear specific challenges uh, for additive manufacturing uh, produced parts, such as irradiation damages uh, and uh, stress uh, corrosion cracking. Uh, Rosatom believes that international cooperation and development of various additive manufacturing applications is critical for further utilization of additive manufacturing into conventional manufacturing and business, including the nuclear. Uh, we invite everybody to join us in this effort and uh, are open to for, for opportunities for cooperation and research and in commercial projects. Thank you, Mikhail. I think, I think that you bring something that is a very important, important point. It's not unique to the nuclear industry, but I think it's particularly important for nuclear and is the importance of cooperation, the importance of multilateral cooperation, because uh, obviously there is some, some uh, needs as far as infrastructure, as far as human resources, as far as facilities that are quite unique uh, in, the, in the nuclear industry, in which international cooperation and multilateral cooperation is super important. So I think you bring a quite important point here. You know, let me turn to, to Rita right now, because I'm just remembering, uh, you know, also talking about this global cooperation and about this idea of bringing together the entire nuclear community. I think that uh, in 2018, uh, EPRI, together with other organizations such as the International Atomic Energy Agency, the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, the National Nuclear Laboratories in the UK, KHMP, um, you uh, started uh, or launched the Global Forum for Nuclear Innovation, which was really uh, a very interesting opportunity to shake things up a little bit in the nuclear uh, sector. To, to accelerate innovation, but also to bring everybody together. So I know that you are working uh, on the next one, which is hopefully going to be in 2022. I know you have had to, to postpone it a couple of times because of all this um, COVID situation. So could you give us maybe an, an advance of preview of what are some of the things that you are going to try to, to do in, in this next uh, global forum to bring the global nuclear industry together into this path towards inno innovation? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, the And the next Global Innovation Forum tentatively has now been pushed out to March of uh, 2022, um, and, and we hope to have it in London. And so looking forward to that. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about it a little bit. Um, in, 20, in 2019, we did have the last global uh, Innovation Forum, and we talked really about disruption and competition. 
and wh why those are healthy to have it, it along with a culture of innovation that is supported. And so we're going to work off of some of those concepts that we discussed two years ago and then um, continue those conversations. Um, some of the thing, other things that we talked about included um, the importance of innovation being recognized from the top. So the, the leaders of an organization appreciating that innovation takes time, it takes a different mindset, it certainly takes money, it takes people to, um, to, to be effective and it allows uh, or it requires be, for folks to be allowed to fail for it to be successful. And, and I wanna say that again, we need to allow people to fail for innovation to be successful. Almost everything that we try, typically almost 90% of the efforts in innovation result in failures. But learning from those failures is what makes innovation successful and allowing, giving permission to learn from those failures is what allows, is what permits innovation to be successful. And so launching off of those notions that innovation starts at the top um, and that innovation must be a culture uh, is, is where we're looking forward to, to starting the conversation again next year in March. Finally, I've already touched on it, but it takes communication being able to accelerate and implement, implement uh, innovative techniques, innovative processes, not just in technology, but in finance, um, in organizational uh, processes, even in communication, it requires communicating among all of the stakeholders. So being effective, communicating often um, are very, very important. And uh, I, I, can, I can say that, uh, I can say this because I'm an engineer, um, I wasn't taught how to communicate effectively. I wasn't really taught how to communicate. And so it's something that I had to learn. Um, I had to get training on and that's okay. But as long as we recognize that communication is important and either we get the tools in our toolkit to communicate effectively, or we, we surround ourselves with, with folks that can communicate effectively, that's going to be very, very important. Our theme for next year's in a Global Innovation Forum is culture change. And so it sort of wraps around all of the things that I've just mentioned. And, and finally, um, the one, one other aspect that we're gonna launch um, off of from the last forum is that uh, innovation is risk mitigation, especially in this industry. Um, we, we need to also focus on, on eliminating uh, risks to the extent that they're possible. Uh, innovation does increase risk, but then with the end goal of, of minimizing risk in the final product, in the final process, um, we, we can be very successful. Yeah, uh, no, that's that's quite exciting. I very much look forward to to hopefully joining you next year for this global forum. You know, I, I think you said something that I think is quite important, and is the importance of yes to have commitment from the top to 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 drive this innovation, but at the same time incentivize uh, people at the ground level, at the working level, to to actually be free to, to try new things and, and to hopefully, I mean, sometimes fail, sometimes succeed. So, so that, that, that combination is, is quite important. So let me go to, to you, Bile, because I think I've seen you uh, saying this uh, somewhere on, on, on social media, that in your opinion, it is necessary to kill your darlings when it comes to determining what are the research and development priorities. So, so could you elaborate for us? What, what did you mean by that? And right. perhaps did, did you feel that the nuclear industry is good or maybe not so good at really applying this, this wisdom? I, uh, I think that this is just a Finnish way of saying the same thing that Rita just told us in a more positive way. I mean, in order to like renew yourself and renew the industry, you must be able to like give up some things that are not like progressing fast enough. And especially now, I mean, we have seen, we are now in the like disruption phase when these uh, kind of like uh, new technologies on like renewables and other energy technologies uh, are being like com coming into the system and uh, with that uh, ch changing it and also we need to step up the game with the climate change so we need to be 
understand what's uh, like relevant, what nuclear energy can do, how can we contribute here? And uh, we, I mean, I came to the field when the Generation 4 International Forum was uh, established and uh, uh, when I looked first uh, the uh, plans, uh, this decade was supposed to be great. I mean, we had development and deployment of all these different kind of uh, one gigawatt uh, new Generation 4 uh, plants and now it's being pushed decades away. On the other hand, we have the SMRs. We have uh, uh, in development in China, in the USA, as, uh, all over the place, but it's a uh, like new I idea. So basically, we just need to be able to be comfortable in also like uh, leaving some other things uh, like uh, to press in order to basically be relevant in the like now in the future and to basically enable the innovation that Rita already was discussing. Thank you, Vile. That's that's yeah, that's quite quite interesting. So you know, I'm going to turn now to Jim, if you don't mind, to to see a completely, hopefully, maybe different point of view. So on your on your on your opinion, um, what would be an ideal innovation ecosystem for the biotech and the pharmaceutical industry that could maybe achieve this perfect balance between? being innovative and bringing the newest and the most up-to-date uh, technology at the same time that you can be commercially pragmatic. Um, what is your opinion, Jim, on that? So that's a tough, que tough question. Um, one of the features of the biotech industry is that it's a medical industry in general, is it's not super profitable, at least at the cutting edge of uh, technology and medicines delivery compared to other industries. Uh, the profit margin is not great, and it's often quite long term. I suppose that's something you might share with your industry. So relying entirely on uh, the market to drive this is not likely to be successful. So there has to be an important role in innovation from government, where there is an ability to take risks, and the payoff may be, uh, you know, zero or it may be just a lot of knowledge that we all feel very good about, but there's no practical product. And um, I think we saw some of that in the development of the vaccines, that those vaccines all came from academic labs and transferred in to commercial world. And I think that that ability of governments to finance where there's market failure, the high risk uh, projects with an uncertain return. And I think the problem for that is that um, often everybody's very keen on high risk, high return, but they know there's a high return by, by definition, high risk, as I think Rita outlined is there's going to be failure and nobody wants to accept failure. Everybody thinks it can be designed out, but by its nature, there will be failure. Government is probably about the best way to do that uh, in the type of work in biotech, but equally, you need a thriving business sector uh, to bring the resources together to get things out of the lab into people. And we saw that again with the vaccine story, but it's been it's replicated in many different areas. The genomics was done by uh, government funding and charity funding, but genomic medicine, the benefits of it will flow from pharmaceutical companies building on that innovation. So to me, you need all of them at the table uh, and underpinning it is public consent and public support. Now, you know, one might hope that that's easy to obtain. Uh, and certainly there's been a lot of public support for science during the COVID pandemic, but politicization and a culture that is, uh, finds it difficult to accept science doesn't help any of us in any of, I think, activities. And so we constantly have to be aware of uh, how we engage the public and what we're doing, how we communicate it, and how we get their support. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, those are very, very important complexities that, that we need to manage very carefully. So let me go to, to you, Nina, and, and let's look at the, the, this, the situation in the renewable energy industry. We talked earlier a little bit about technology, of course, but we also discussed a little bit um, policy, business, finance, regulation, and public acceptance. So I truly, truly think that, that the, the, the renewable community has done a fabulous job uh, bringing all those things together. 
So, so would you say, for example, um, as you said earlier, the public acceptance communications, which is something that Rita mentioned earlier, is this particularly important, you think, in, in renewables or, or is just one more piece of the puzzle? Oh, it's absolutely vital. Now, I mean, the governments around the world, if they're doing the job, will survey public opinion. But um, still many, many people, when it comes to energy, they know climate change is important. But more importantly still is the size of their energy bill and the fact that they can still rely that the lights come on when they flick a switch and so on and so forth. It's still with in the UK, for instance, now there's more than, you know, one and I think one 1.5 million homes now have solar on them. So they've changed from being the businesses and the people in the homes have changed from being just consumers, but being prosumers. So they are producing their own energy. And as soon as you are getting a bit closer to your energy source, you become more interested. So it starts off with people wanting solar panels. Now it's about heat pumps in their homes. And now, of course, the next exciting tech after your iPhone or other similar smartphones is the burgeoning market for electric vehicles. And what that means, the sexiness of Tesla versus the, the need to find a really cheap alternative of less than four or five thousand dollars that will replace the, the diesel or um, fossil fuel pumping vehicles on the roads, they've all become interconnected. Now, ultimately though, people don't wanna pay for that change. The, the, the price in the purse is still really important and energy is very political and a government will stand or fall sometimes on how they impact the energy bill. And so, Having a technology that actually is potentially going to be reducing people's bills has got to be a good thing. And this is where probably renewables will score some further points compared to maybe uh, other sectors like nuclear and the fact that cost is very, very important. So if a government has to choose, other than from an energy security point of view, where is it going to? set the market framework in order to deliver the energy security, there's going to be such challenging pressures around not wanting to pick winners, but in the fact the market and the price of those technologies and their ability to robustly deliver will be absolutely key. Because now there's no denying everything now has to be low carbon. It has to be, you know, with in COP26, the four big principal areas that they're going to be discussing is about adaptation. The countries that can't afford to change their major infrastructure and invest in large low carbon technologies, how do we help them to catch up and that there's a just transition? It's not just for the rich and the elite. The other aspect is financing it all and understanding the risk linked with that financing of it all. And then the other bit is public engagement and business engagement. The finance community has been really key now in setting expectation and leading corporates and the messaging that they say. So I did refer to iPhone and Apple, who now are 100% renewably powered across all of their different um, uh, facilities around the world. That's what they're selling their product on, and they're making a stand on that. So there's push and pulls, and there's carrots and sticks. And the market is important, but we need the government to also catch up with how fast the technology is changing. And in part of my job nearly every day is to remind government that technology is outstripping the regulatory and the policy framework. They have to catch up. Now, other technologies that want to play in the net zero world also need to now catch up. Yes, uh, I completely agree. You know, I think um, you brought something that I don't know whether we will have time to explore in more detail, but I think it's the importance of looking uh, in electricity, but more, more and more, yeah. not just electricity, but energy systems as a whole. 
So I, I agree with you that there is an enormous responsibility from, from governments and policymakers to look at the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. so, so while we need to ensure that the system is reliable, stable, and, and robust, at the same time that we provide the lowest price to, to consumers so they can, they can obviously uh, achieve the standard of, of quality of life that, that we all want to have. So I really think it's super important to have this holistic approach when we look at the entire system and see how the different technologies can fit and, and work together. So that's that's quite quite interesting. So you know, I'm going to turn now to you, Mikhail, um, to talk a little bit more about uh, the opportunities that that these uh, new technologies like 3D printing bring. Uh, to, to all sectors in particular. So obviously you talked a little bit uh, about the, the 3D printing within the context of Rosatom and on the uh, Russian designs, but obviously uh, there is many other designs and many other technologies that are nuclear in the world. So are you, are you looking into expanding or, or, or supporting other reactor designs and maybe partnering with other international collaborators to, to advance the use of additive manufacturing in the nuclear energy sector? Uh, well, um, thank you for this question. It's a very good one. I believe that uh, the 3D printing technologies that we are working on at the moment for the nuclear applications are universal and can be used for printing of uh, final parts for nuclear reactors, uh, regardless of their types. Um, here again, uh, we have to have in mind uh, the standardization question. International exchange of experience in additive manufacturing application in the nuclear industry is extremely important. Um, it includes the exchange of uh, data, of certification of new additive manufacturing materials and technologies, adaptation of existing standards and development of new ones, etc. Uh, anyway, I believe that uh, we will be ready to present some good uh, additive manufacturing solutions for non-Russian design uh, nuclear power plants uh, shortly. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now that sounds very exciting. So let's go to Dr. Dr. Chen. From, from the Chinese point of view, I mean, you mentioned a few minutes ago an enormous amount of, of innovation in many core areas such as fuels or reactor designs or maybe the applications, whether it is heat or, or hydrogen, uh, et cetera. So, so when you are looking at, at all these different uh, technologies, where do you think there is more value? On the, on the nuclear focused technologies or perhaps uh, on the supporting areas such as digital technology, manufacturing, new materials. I mean, there is probably a compromise between both sides of the equation. I do believe the answer is also in the uh, presentation. Could you show that for me, please? Perfect. And this is one more thing I would like to emphasize size here called the utilization of fusion power. Actually, actually, for our age, for our era, the technology is the whole combination. You cannot have a short part of your barrow and you, stand, you still can have the whole technology together, especially if it's like, a, it's, it's like in the engineering sector, like nuclear like fusion. So you need to have the whole, all parts from your understanding of the nucleus, the nuclear data, as well as you have the most advanced digital system, as well as the best team in the world. The this integration makes the whole thing harder as also um, the CEO of Rescom has indicated that one country, only just by one, it seems even to be impossible, but the whole nuclear sector could come together, forming a consortium to resolve the issue. And we have learned, for, for example, this fusion power, we have learned a lot from the ITER project 
and we are also devoting our efforts to it. Next slide, please. Yes, um, when I was so young, when I was still a child, that I could read from the uh, comics, from the books, that the generation, as my father, and even the generation before him, they, they are talking about that we are only 50, we're only 50, half of a century away from the fusion power to become feasible. And after generations have generations, and now, just a few years ago, now we are only 40 years from it. We are 10 years ahead of it. And the thing I would like to bring it here is that this is not by, this is not done by one group of people. And this is not done by one country. This is done by the whole world and by everyone looking, trying to find a better future for all human beings. The connection, the COVID pandemic shows today we are all connected and no one is isolated. Even we would like to try to facing a disaster like this, but still, still, essentially, we're connected. And we hope it would be how we could face the challenge like climate challenges in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I think that it's quite, quite inspiring. I mean, I, I agree with you that uh, we are all in this together. And, you know, as, as COVID was a uh, 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 critical time for, for, for example, the pharmaceutical industry to, to step up to the plate and, and help the humanity to, to get out of this crisis. I think that all energy technologies, nuclear, one of them, we really have the challenge cut out to us right now to step up to the plate because the, 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 the size and the urgency of the climate change challenge is just as dire. And I really think that we all really need to bring up uh, the, the, the best that we have to, to try to solve this challenge. So I completely agree with you. So, you know, I have many more questions for all of you, but clearly our time is almost up. So what I really wanted to do to, to close this panel is maybe ask you, I'm going to go around, around the table to each one of you with one final question. Um, and with this final question, I'm really going to ask you to get your, your crystal balls out on the table and to look at them and see what you see. So if we were to, to meet again, and of course, you know, you should probably get your calendars and put it in the calendar. So if we meet again in five years, and notice that I'm giving you a very short time, only five years, and we were going to continue this conversation, what do you think? that we will discuss, what do you think will be the topics or, or perhaps the areas of innovation that will be more, more prevalent? So I'm maybe going to go around the table to see if I can get you a very last, relatively short answer to that question. So if you don't mind, Rita, I will start with you. Sure. So uh, since I'm in the nuclear area, um, I think in five years, we will hopefully have seen a lot more digitization of um, the, the power plants. Right now, we have many, many analog systems that have yet to be converted to digital. So there's that piece of it. And then also, um, let me jump to from existing fleet to advanced reactors. I am optimistic that we will see uh, deployed and operating advanced nuclear reactors in several parts of the world. Very exciting. I look forward to meeting in five years and chat about all that. Dr. Chen, what do you think? Uh, uh, for me, within just five years, uh, two things I can promise. I will introduce you for the um, power center as it's um, progressively under con construction. And also I will show you how economically feasible of high temperature gas cooled reactor could be, as well as its demonstration for the application of process heating. 
and that will be quite interesting. Yeah, that right there will be a game changer, as you said, I mean, to actually help the carbonized sectors beyond electricity with nuclear would be a total game changer. So that sounds very exciting. So Jim, what do you think from, from your side in biotech pharmacy, what is going to be new and exciting? Uh, I think we'll see a huge shift to more personalized medicine. Uh, I think that will be the theme. Uh, I think inequality will be a big driver in medicine, uh, both within societies and countries. So within a single country and between countries, the, the idea that uh, some people benefit hugely from these new medicines and others can't afford them. Uh, is, and I think that inequity will be a, will be a serious problem to confront. Um, I actually have a thought in your industry, actually, if you don't, if I'm um, not being cheeky, to say that I think uh, what Rita said is really, really important. I think if we don't see that innovation coming very soon, I think it's likely to be a dead duck in Europe and the US that the cost overruns the political, you know, you move beyond the, the safety worries, which, you know, I'm a scientist, I understand the science, simply the economics. Are, are so difficult for these big plants that we're building in the UK and others are building in Europe. That without innovation, I think the industry is is for the, the graveyard in those countries. I could not agree with you more and uh, with what Rita said. I mean, I mentioned earlier the importance. I mean, this is a critical time because we have this huge uh, climate change challenge, but I would say that is particularly critical for nuclear because as we said, we really need to demonstrate that in fact, all the things that we are promising in fact are going to happen and they are going to happen on, on time and on budget. So I completely agree with you both. So let me go to you, Nina. What do you see in your crystal ball? You are muted, Nina. My crystal ball has become a little less foggy now that there is such commitment by all the nations to meet net zero. And we do know that power, you know, low carbon, renewable power has to do the heavy lifting across power, heat, and heating and cooling and transport. So I see that there will be a massive ramp up of wind, solar, and a really strong focus on um, decarbonizing and sustainable bioenergy because we have to start to tackle aviation as well. So, um, and, and whilst people are very excited always about the hydrogen and what's gonna be done with that, um, I think we're still going to have to make sure that we work across the world, that we build and manage a sustainable forestry, but also to use it as a, a, a viable resource to help us uh, to decarbonize the difficult to decarbonize sectors that power and electricity can't do on their own. Um, I think in the more richer side, unfortunately, I think everybody will be using this and know exactly what their carbon footprint is. They will know what their house is doing, where the nearest car charging point will be. At the moment, we're right at the very beginnings of EV and the deployment and at the moment it's early de development so there's about 20 different apps that you might need to know how to charge your car very quickly the sector must settle down um, and and the value developed for the consumer rather than just for the burgeoning new technologies so everything has to be looked at through the lens of the consumer and a decarbonized future so those are my more than one wish sorry well, those are those are very exciting. I do personally look forward to to a lot of those, and you know, and and you said that I think that uh, we we put a lot of focus and we've been fairly successful so far to decarbonize the electricity sector, but you said that there are many other sectors, for example, transportation in particular, shipping, whether it's yeah. shipping or or air travel, where where certainly we really need to put our brains together in there to, to really achieve the, the decarbonization that we need. So let's let's work on that. Mm -hmm. Let me go to to Bile. What do you see in your crystal ball? Uh, from technology wise, I think uh, Rita and Jen already were quite exhaustive, but uh, I think what if this uh, technology and demonstration uh, comes through, what we are also seeing is uh, 
industry reinventing itself in a way of uh, communication. I'm looking at the Q&A here and there's lots of things, uh, questions about how nuclear energy is seen as a bad, a bad thing or in a uh, poor way and what is going to be done. And I'm just looking forward seeing all these like uh, new and improved like self-confidence that we are seeing. And I especially like very much the World Nuclear Association's response to the latest IAA scenario where you said that we actually can do a lot more. So, right. So. Yeah, I agree. I think that the, the nuclear community, we have not been very, as you said, particularly good at communicating our potential and everything that we can do. And we really are here ready to step up to the plate and to support all other low carbon energy sources in this huge challenge that we have in front of us. So, so let's do that. So Mikhail, you get the last word. What do you see in your crystal ball? Innovations. <laughs> uh, uh, additive technologies, additive manufacturing is already a reali reality. And the, in uh, several years, uh, uh, this new industry will replace uh, some traditional methods of uh, production, like uh, casting method, for example. Uh, that's why uh, I strongly be believe that in five years, uh, um, we we're going to print uh, not only some parts of a reactor, for example, uh, but uh, even uh, the whole, uh, for example, uh, research reactor uh, will be printed uh, you know, with additive technologies, with additive manufacturing. And this will be new industry, new reality, in, and new effective uh, methods of, uh, uh, of uh, energy uh, produ production. And uh, what else is important uh, in additive manufacturing, that uh, it's a production process uh, which uses less resources and even gives you an opportunity of repairs of parts and components with a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, environmental um, benefits as a result. Yeah, very exciting. I mean, we didn't have time to discuss that, but I, you know, there is all these opportunities of integrating additive manufacturing, digital threads, and and, and data-driven information. So that's tons of exciting opportunities there. So I want to, uh, even though I would, I could really continue chatting with all of you for quite a lot longer. Uh, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our of our webinar. And I want to, first of all, thank all our speakers to, for, for coming here and bringing very interesting, very insightful thoughts on how to perhaps cross-pollinate good ideas and best practices among different industries to really uh, move forward the case for, for decarbonization and achieving sustainable development in a just matter from, from everybody. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for, to all of you that are out there in the world listening and, and thank you also for all the questions. Uh, some of the questions have been answered uh, in, the, in the chat, but all of them we will finalize answering the questions and we will post them in the, in the website so you can see the answers. So thank you everybody. I also want to thank uh, our sponsors for supporting uh, these this strategic forums that we will continue to do to bring topics that we think are relevant and important to the, to the nuclear industry. So I once again want to thank all of you and wish you a fabulous rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you in the next strategic forum that will be uh, in mid-October. And we will be focusing on the role of nuclear energy within the context of climate change and sustainability in preparation, of course, for uh, the work that we are all doing with regards to Glasgow and COP26. So with that, I wish you a fabulous day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>